Well, as uh, Captain and Tennille said, love keeps us together, together right? Uh, Pablo Cruz, love will find a way. Love will find a way. Hey, right? Uh, Huey Lewis, it's just the power of love, right? The power of love, right? Uh, but be careful, because according to Def Leppard, Love bites. Aaron knows Def Leppard. Of course you do, Aaron. Aaron's, Aaron's back there going, Love bites! Love bleeds! Right? What about Jake Alice? Love stinks. Yeah, love stinks, right? Yeah. Oh, how, here's, if, let's get biblical. Nazareth? Love hurts. Love hurts! Right? Yeah? But love isn't its own thing. There is no mystical force of love that does things or doesn't do things for you, which is why a better song came from DC Talk's rap album, Love is a Verb, <laughs> right? <laughs> if I could play that song for you, you guys would really laugh. It is as cheeseball, cheesy, cheesy white boy rap as you ever wanted to know about, yeah? But I don't know, haven't you heard love, love, love is a verb. Because <laughs> love is what it does, is right? It's not a pro, it's not a noun. Okay, so with that in mind, because we're going to be talking a lot about love over the next six weeks or so. So um, let me just br briefly do the housekeeping because it's all, it's all you same people. I don't really, in fact, looking around, I don't really need to add anything. The only thing I will say, because I do like to say this at the beginning of every lesson to remind everybody that I hold the right to cut you off, <laughs> right? And to say, okay, 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 or you've talked too much or whatever, okay? We got to keep moving, we got to keep moving. And most of you know that already, wouldn't be offended if I'm like, no, 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 we got to go, we got to go. Okay, that's my job. Uh, we're obviously, we'll be in the book of First John tonight. If you want to know how to get there, just drive all the way to Revelation, put it in reverse and go back to <laughs> It's like the easiest way to find it. Well, you'll come first to John 3, but I think you okay. can... Or th three John, I mean, three John, and you can work your way back from there, I'm sure. Uh, the commentaries I will be using, uh, John MacArthur, obviously, but also uh, the Expositor's Bible Commentary by a guy by the name of Glenn Barker, who I've been very impressed with uh, thus far in my studies. And also, I would suggest go watch The Bible Project. Uh, it's an eight-minute video on YouTube. Uh, just the It's actually all of them, first, second, and third John, but it focuses... About 80% of it is all about 1 John. It's a, great, it's a great overview to sort of set up the whole thing. And I will be using a little bit of that. I want to talk to you real briefly about the timing on it. It's five chapters long. And we're going to do one chapter a night. Um, the reason why is because in two weeks, I almost don't want to tell you this because half of you won't show up next week. So we are meeting next week, right? <laughs> we will be here next week. The following week, however, is Sage and Hope Sierras' wedding reception here at the church on Tuesday night. And so we're going to obviously cancel the Bible study. That's the 19th. If you have a calendar, you want to write that down in your calendar. No Bible study on the 19th. And then we will wrap up uh, August 9th. And then I'm leaving for a few weeks. So uh, we will have a, about a four-week break from there. And then, do y'all want to know what we're going to do when I get back? Yes. Judges. Dun, 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 dun. Judges. Sam why? Look at why. Samson and I. And we're going to do Judges between September 10th and Christmas break. Two chapters a night. And then come January, I'm really excited about this, by special request, back, the book of Galatians. Oh, yeah. We're going to jump into grace. And the reason why we're waiting for January to do Galatians is because we don't want to put a time limit on it. We want to be able to go as long as we want and take our sweet time. And we also, I also want all the snowbirds to be here. All you people that are watching at home. We're waiting for you to come back. Yeah. And we'll do Galatians. Okay. Um, so now let me introduce it this way. I picked first John. Almost jokingly, in the middle of all the bloodshed of Joshua, because, <laughs> you know, we're right in the thick of everybody getting put to the sword and horses getting hamstrung and, you know, villages being burnt down. It was like, we should follow this with something a little lighter, yeah? And I thought, why not the love chapter, you know, the love book, yeah? 
But I will tell you this, uh, looking back on how I thought about 1 John, I kind of um, quite honestly misunderstood the book of 1 John. If you had asked me about a week ago, what is 1 John about, what's it like, even after having read through it, because I read through it a bunch over the last few weeks, you know, getting ready for it. You know, it would seem like it would be a extended um, exposition of Jesus saying, you know, the greatest commandment is love your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And, you know, love your brother as yourself, or you will know each other by their love, or one of those love verses. Um, you know, love God and love people. Uh, just love each other. But I got to tell you, man, when I started my deep dive a few days ago into the book, I really discovered some interesting stuff. Uh, for example, the historical context that we're going to get into tonight, because tonight we're going to just basically do chapter one, which is very short, but I'm going to set up the historical context. And the theological response from John um, and you um, to these challenges of the early church, particularly in Asia Minor, which we'll get to in a second, which remember Asia Minor is like Turkey, which is modern Turkey and maybe as far south as Syria, whatever, or Lebanon, yeah? Um, but at the time, when I say Asia Minor, you're thinking Ephesus, uh, the churches of Galatia and Philippi, Thess not Thessalonica, that would be over in uh, Greece. Um, but anyways, um, but here's the interesting thing. What was going on there makes this letter super relevant to us today. I would almost say it makes it more relevant for us today than the last 2,000 years of church history. That's a pretty big boast, isn't it? Yeah? We'll see if I can make good on that boast. So let me, let me um, open up a little bit with a little um, introduction. Okay. In terms of the church at the time, um, where the book of 1 John picks up, we're at the far end of the apostolic era. What do I mean by that? Well, John is, is or was, I should say, likely the last surviving apostle. Yeah. To put it in context... Paul has been dead for about 25 years when this book is written. Are you with me? Like, okay, see what's going on here? Paul has been dead for 25 years. And we have churches now spread out all over um, Asia Minor, uh, all the way up into, I wrote it, Southern Europe, but it wasn't really called Europe at the time, but just geographically, you know, bear with me, Italy and slightly north of Italy. Uh, down and down into Africa, Alexandria and into Ethiopia, right? All around there, the church, right? But here's, uh, let me read, read you this quote. Um, Asia, Mi Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey, the region forms a land bridge between the continents of Europe, Asia, and Africa, across which flowed the tides of invasion and migration. As a result... At this particular time, it was a melting pot of ideas, philosophies, and religions. Now think about that. You've got all these different pagan religions. You have emperor worship. You have Judaism, still fully strong, um, even, even in the towns of Asia Minor. Yeah? And you have the new Christian church. John, who's old now, we don't know exactly how old, but he's living in Ephesus. Now, isn't that interesting? Paul's been dead for 25 years. He's now living in Ephesus. And obviously, he is worshiping, if not teaching, and most likely leading as an apostle, the church that Paul founded 25 years earlier. Are you with me? It's pretty cool stuff, historically. Huh? If you like history, I love this kind of stuff. And what is still happening in Ephesus? They are still worshiping who? Anybody? Artemis. 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 Remember Artemis, Artemis? They had that, um, the temple at Ephesus, the temple of Artemis, which was considered one of the seven, what is it? Wonders. wonders. Seven wonders of the world as an architectural masterpiece. Yeah. And so John is writing this letter because he's deeply concerned that, are, that there are all these competing ideologies and theologies both externally from false religions, but also popping up internally in the church through false teachers. Now, let me ask you, does that sound kind of familiar? <laughs> Think about the world we live in. Uh, MacArthur says this, in our inclusive age, 
of secularism, postmodern relativism, New Age cults, and militant world religions, the apostles' words of warning and assurance are both timely and relevant. We live in a pluralistic, theological, philosophical <laughs> society, right? And it's, you know, <laughs> to be dramatic, and it's all right there waiting for you, right? And we also have challenges within the church of false teachers that are teaching, you know, as Paul would say, a gospel that is no gospel at all, which we'll get to in January. That's from Galatians, yeah? Okay, who wrote the book? <laughs> I know. Now, believe it or not, apparently there's some debate about this. Um, as usual, I wasted way too much time, about an hour, to come to the conclusion that John wrote it, yeah? <laughs> But um, there, there were some historical um, paperwork that came up that did challenge it. Um, but a couple interesting things. First of all, there's only two New Testament letters, not Gospels, two New Testament letters that don't identify the author. This, these three letters, and anybody name the other one? Hebrews. Hebrews. I knew, I knew Ron would get that, yeah? I was sort of surprised there is a debate, but it was caused by a reference to somebody called John the Elder, who was apparently around at that time, John the Elder, and so some people um, thought maybe that was the guy. However, when I began to read the evidence in favor of being John, it's overwhelming. My favorite piece of evidence is the fact that John had a disciple named Polycarp, some of you have heard of them, who also discipled a guy named Irenaeus, who says that John wrote it. So that's a pretty tight historical, right? Um, trail, right? So let's just briefly review him. This is John, the son of Zebedee, remember, whose mom asked if he could sit at the right or left hand of God, right? Remember him? Yeah. Can we sit at your right hand? He is very likely a cousin, blood cousin of Jesus. Also, he was a disciple of John the Baptist, which by the way is a little detail that I forgot. Remember we were talking last week about some of these people that were at one point slaves in Egypt went all through the desert and were now free in the Holy Land, you know? And we're like, wow. Well, dude, think about it. This guy's been around since John the Baptist, and he's been through the whole life of Jesus, right? And the formation of the church through Paul, he's still going. It's pretty amazing, huh, right? Uh, okay, the more, more fun stuff. Uh, by the way, he was also the one whom the Lord loved. Now, he spent the last couple of decades of, what's that? He said. He says, I know, yeah. he, call, he calls himself the disciple that God, that Jesus loved, the Lord loved. Yeah, I love that. Um, now, he has spent the last couple decades of his life in Ephesus, where he wrote the Gospel of John between about A.D. 80 and A.D. 90. And then he wrote 1 John, I always call it John 1, John 2, but it's 1 John, 2 John, 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 <laughs> 3 <laughs> 3 John, immediately thereafter, like he probably finished the Gospel of John in AD 90 and immediately started on these three letters, although some call them sermons, but we won't know the difference, between 90 and 94, after which in 94 was when he was exiled to Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation, Revelation between 94 and 96. Now the chronology is going to be a little important later, as I'm going to share with you, that he does the Gospel of John the three Johns, yeah, and then the book of Revelation, his three big masterpieces, particularly John. If you're familiar with the Gospel of John, um, most scholars view it as a literary masterpiece. It is really, uh, if you've ever done a deep dive study, it is, it's just, it's amazing. Anyways, okay, and though he was known as the Apostle of Love, he was also known to be a real fiery character, right? Um, as I recall, once he asked Jesus to call down thunder, <laughs> Bonerges, right? Yeah. He was also known as fearless. There's a written, uh, a written uh, documented uh, event where he had led a uh, guy who had been a former, I would call it in our terminology, gang member, but he led a band of robbers uh, to the Lord. Uh, he, he led the leader of the band and the guy backslid and John went out and found their camp and went in and dragged the guy out and called him to repentance. I thought that was a pretty cool story. So he was pretty, pretty fearless. That? What's that? Where'd you hear that? I don't know. I read it. 
<laughs> on the internet. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> that actually, I can tell you, that came through the expositor's commentary. So uh, by whatever, I gave you the name, Glenn Burnett or something like that, yeah? Okay, before we actually start the book, though, we do need to do a very brief yeah. review yeah. on the cult of Gnosticism, which, by the way, like a lot of things in history, you, you've heard about the Gnostics, you've heard about Gnosticism, but when you do a deep dive into history, it turns out it, there wasn't one movement led by one guy. It was sort of a multi-headed, multi-faceted movement, yeah? Um, but it's going to feature greatly in the book of John. In fact, the book of 1 John is what I meant. The book of 1 John is really a response to Gnosticism. Does that make sense? So we sort of have to know what we're talking about. So just to put it in context, Gnosticism is a conglomeration of various pagan Jewish quasi-Christian and Greek philosophy. Uh, most of you know that gnosis or gnosis means knowledge or wisdom. One of the sort of overlying umbrella um, concepts of Gnosticism is super important, and that is that matter, as in flesh material things, yeah, is inherently evil. And spirit is inherently good. Thus, their first heretical teaching is that Jesus was not both human and deity. Jesus did not live in a real physical body. Now, they had a few ways of trying to get around that. Some claim that the entire life of Jesus, he was only an apparition, like a ghost, but he wasn't fully human. Other sects of the Gnostics would say, uh, he became divine at baptism and the spirit left him before the crucifixion. So do, do that as you may. Um, therefore, here's the catch. And this is a lot of what the response of John centers around. Their, their philosophical dualism, this divide between the material and the spiritual, meant that they didn't have to pay attention to any ethical behavior or moral values. Here's why. Sin is not a problem because it's just the body. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there's no connection between sin and the spirit. My body can do whatever my body wants to do or needs to do. Look, Greg's laughing. Can you see why this would be a problem? <laughs> I thought it wasn't a problem. <laughs> see, that's the problem. And I'm so glad you said that, Greg. We, we, we planned that. But Greg's response is exactly right. Now you see how enticing this philosophy was to Christians who were trying to live, you know, especially a converted pagan who was used to living this very sensuous, you know, um, Bacchanal background where, you know, temple prostitutes were part of the whole program, right? Now they're trying to live this righteous life and somebody comes along and goes, no, 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 no. Jesus was never fully human because material is evil. Let me introduce you to Gnostic thing. And then you can do whatever you want. You see how dangerous that could be. It's a powerful incitement. By the way, there's a modern version of that that somebody actually just said to me last week. But God wants me to be happy, right? Yeah. Guess what my answer was? No. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Guess what the look on his face was? I hope he's not watching this, my God. Can you edit that out, actually? Yeah. But that actually happened. He actually said. And by the way, this is not a young person. This is somebody early 70s, actually. Not you, Ron. <laughs> he said that, but literally said that. God wants me to be happy, right? That is a very similar to a Gnostic argument, right? My happiness is more important than righteousness and obedience and sin and all that sin stuff. But I need to be happy, yeah? Isn't that interesting, yeah? Um, that was just last week. Uh, this is why first in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, he says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, we'll actually get to that verse tonight, but you see what's going on here? Who's claiming to be without sin the Gnostics. Okay, so that's a key point because knowing what, the re knowing what the book is in response to is going to shed much more light on some of the statements. 
that otherwise might sound a little legalistic, if that makes sense, because it's going to sound like, but wait, how can I be perfect, right? You'll make, it makes sense. Now, um, I want to point this out before we actually get into the book, and then we'll, uh, this will be the end of the introduction. But um, the first two books that John writes, the first one is the Gospel of John, and look what he says. In the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 31, he says this, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So why was it written? That you might believe. Now look what he says at the end of the book of 1 John, chapter 5, 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. The Gospel of John is an evangelical tract, as it were. It is written so that you would be led into belief. Does that make sense? 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John is written to believers to grab a hold of the eternal life that they have already professed. Do you see the difference between the two books? I found that today. I thought that was great. So I wanted to share that with you. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump in. Chapter 1. Uh, we're going to actually read 1 in the first part of 2. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaimed you the eternal life, which was with the Father as he appeared to us. I went a little too far. But that which was from the beginning, right, con concerning the word of life, what does that sound a lot like? <laughs> yeah, it sounds a lot like John chapter 1. Funny you should think so. As it turns out, 80% of the verses, I don't know who figured this out, but MacArthur gave me this, 80% of the verses in 1 John reflect concepts that are in the Gospel of John. Only now, instead of being told this to evangelize us, it's bringing home how we live in this salvation. You see the difference? Yeah? So yeah, it sounds very similar to in the beginning was the word, a powerful, obvious, and blatant claim at the deity of Christ, that he was begotten, not made, which means he is the creator, not the created. Only now, immediately, look what John does. He includes himself and others into the statement. So the Gospel of John starts out, in the beginning, there was, and there was, and there was. But look what he says here. That's what it was from the beginning, which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. Are you catching what he's saying here? Touched. Who's he talking at right there? Gnostics. The Gnostics, exactly. Those who believe that Christ wasn't fully human or material, that he was an apparition, a ghost. You see what John is doing? Very, very specifically there, yeah? We heard him, we saw him, and we touched the word, think of that, the word of God. Because the word of God is a transcendent idea. Look what John just did right there. Is that cool or what? He took a transcendent idea and said, I touched it. Is that cool or what? Okay. Uh, total hack of a statement to begin refuting Gnosticism that he touched the word. The, the concept of the word became three-dimensional. And then he says, um, when it says the life appeared, um, the word phanero actually means the life was manifested, which means to reveal which was hidden. God revealed himself through his son, um, Jesus Christ, that which we saw, we heard and touched. Um, and I love how he says over and over, we testify and we proclaim to you. He says it was manifested to us, what was revealed to us, what we saw, what we heard, and what we touched, we now manifest the same word we are revealing to you. And I love how he uses the word we. This isn't just me, but this vast cloud of witnesses, yeah? And then we get to um, sort of the big punchline here in verse 3. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have, here we go, fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ wow okay this is big all encompassing fellowship um i need to pause here for a often taught um 
example of relationship in the Bible. Sorry, my apologies to those of you that are here all the time, which is all of you, so my apologies to all of you. But I only found this out myself about two or three years ago, and I was shocked and sort of humbled that I didn't know this already, um, at least in the clarity in which it was explained. And that was the idea that I have been created, created by relationship for relationship. And I know it's a, I've told it to you too many times, but I forgot. The Trinity is a relationship. It's a relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are a relationship. And I am created by a relationship. I am created in relationship. And I am created for relationship. And I'm created for relationship with God and with you all, right? By, I just, for some reason, that skipped by me for the first 28 years or something I was a Christian. And I just think it's too important to skip by right here. Um, the word, most of you know the Greek word for fellowship. Anybody? Kalenian. It's funny how everybody knows that. It, the root word, part of that root word means a common cause, but I love this part. A shared, shared life. A life shared. Isn't that awesome? Yeah? Um, MacArthur said this, it is far more than a mere partnership of those who have the same beliefs and are that strong together. Rather, it is the mutual life and the love of those who are one in spirit. Best example I can think to give you that is, as I often explain this to um, uh, youngsters be, uh, when I go through premarital counseling, and those of you that have been married you, or are married, you know this. It's something happens on the wedding day. I remember driving home from my wedding, looking at my wife going, wow, we're married. It feels really different all of a sudden. Like, like that kind of relationship is different than just being buddies, right? Um, this, um, oh, by the way, what's important about this as Steve Farrell loves to preach, the idea that you can be a solo act in the faith, it's a lie. It's actually a lie. Um, you know, when you hear people say, well, what I believe my spiritual life is a personal thing. Well, good for you, but that is not biblical spiritual life, just so you know. So if you have somebody's like a new ager and they're like, my, my beliefs are personal to me. Well, if you're a new ager, I don't care. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> You might want to edit that out too, yeah? Those <laughs> wackadoodles. Now, whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you're a Christian and you've heard Christians say this, I'm a Christian, but I'm not, I don't, I'm not into church. Oh, I can't stand the Christians. They're so hypocritical. Organized religion. Yeah, organ, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a, I believe in Jesus, but I'm not into organized religion. Eh, really? I would try this. Show me where in Scripture where you have any excuse and watch me show you about 15 odd verses off the top of my head that say just the opposite. Now, I'm not alone on this. Every single commentator that I read today, which was three, yeah, had a pretty hard statement about that. Uh, one guy by the name of Brunner said this. Fellowship with Christ and fellowship with men are correlative. The one cannot exist without the other. Cannot. And what does that say about people that are like, I just don't go to church? What does that say about their fellowship with Christ? They don't have one. Exactly. They don't have one. Exactly. Okay. Um, real brief story. I think I've shared this too many times, but I haven't shared it already. Um, the story about Jim Graham when he passed away was his wife, Linda, had been pulled into the church for, gosh, 15 years or so. was in the middle of everything. And Jim would come, what, twice a year? Something like that? Maybe twice a year. And when he did show up, he kind of came in with the chip on his shoulder. And I remember seeing him there. And he's like, yeah, like everybody's trying to make me all religious and everything. And then he got really sick, death, deathly sick. And the whole church rallied around him. We had a big giant fundraiser here with Titus Kenny Maka guys playing. And, and the church fully rallied around him. And I went to go see him a lot. Actually, he was in the hospital, but about a week before he died. So quite literally on his deathbed. It was just the two of us in his hospital room. And he said, you know, Dan, I really blew it. And I said, what's that? And he said, you know, all those years that Linda, you know, fellowship with you guys. He didn't use that word. That's, that's my word. But all the years that I didn't go to church and everything, I never knew. And I missed it. And now it's too late. But when I saw how awesome you guys were, I realized what I'd been missing the whole time. Wow. How's that? Yeah. We are born again to be in fellowship 
with each other. And the last thing I'll say about that, and then we'll read the last verse um, before questions, is the second revelation I had uh, regarding fellowship and, and that was um, when I realized how lopsided I and my heart had made the communion ceremony, the Eucharist. I had always thought it was about the blood of Christ forgiving me and my communion with God. That's only about half right. We are to enter into communion together, which is why we're not to approach the table with bitterness in our hearts and division in our hearts. It is about celebrating the communion we have with God and with each other. It's a vital part. This is why we take communion together, right? Together in koinonia fellowship. Okay, uh, last verse, I don't have much to say about, so then if you have questions or comments, but we write this to make our joy complete. Now, most uh, commentators that I read on this verse, verse four, uh, we write this to make our joy complete, focused mostly on the biblical definition of joy. So I'm just gonna read you a very quick one from a guy named Glenn Barker. Um, joy is a gift of the Father, even as the Son is a gift of the Father and is present wherever the fellowship truly appears. But joy can never be perfectly known or fully complete because the fellowship itself, the real, is imperfectly realized. The present joy is a token of the ultimate expression of joy at the final revelation of the Son. So we experience the joy now, but it's only a small part of the final joy that we'll have when we're fully, when God is fully revealed to us. So most people talk about the joy, but I found something interesting um, and it came out through the NIV thing here where um, another translation of the same that other manuscripts says, it says this, we write this to make your joy complete, your joy. And I thought this is really interesting and I thought that maybe fit better. Here's why. In the gospel of John, we learn how to receive salvation. Now he's saying, we, we are writing this for you to help make your joy complete, that you would learn to walk in the true orthodox faith that we are now going to explain to you over the next four and a half chapters. Does that make sense? We write this, this letter, to make your joy complete, right? Isn't that interesting? I kind of like that. And it was my own idea, so yeah. You can kind of, um, you get the sense that this is the last line of the introduction, right? And so before we continue any further, he wraps up the introduction saying, we're writing this that your joy will be complete, right? It, it's, it's a foreshadowing of the purpose of what he's writing, which I thought was really a fun way to look at it, but I didn't see anybody else say that. Okay, questions and comments, Luigi. So three and four both start with we. We, yeah. We proclaim, we write. Mm -hmm. Just your comments on who we is. Right. Oh, we, uh, good question. He's the only probably surviving right. apostle. My guess is that he chose those words because, and this is just a guess yeah. off the top of my head. My guess is because he's made such a big deal about our fellowship. Right. And I also imagine it this way. Um, there, even though like there's all this external uh, distraction from Orthodox Christianity, the church has grown. This is 30 years since Christ, right? The church is establishing footholds all over the world. Um, at this point, I imagine they probably have presbytos, right? Bishops, right? Being appointed around, perhaps in Rome or whatever, yeah? Elders have been appointed. Deacons have been appointed. I wonder if John is writing this like on behalf of the church universal yeah. of, him, of whom he's probably the ranking guy. That, that's, that, that's a good question. Does anybody else have a comment on that? Why, why the, and if you look how many times he says we yeah. in the first uh, chapter, I started saying it, but it got redundant. It was like, we, 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 yeah? Yeah, I kind of, I kind of thought, you know, you know it's, he says we, on behalf of all of us. Yeah. Which is what you just said. Yeah. Church Universal, yeah. It was right? probably 35 or 40 years after Christ. 30 or, 35 or 40 years after Christ. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. Which I wonder, yeah, I wonder what the delay is because I typically think of John being written 30 years after the other three Gospels were written. So perhaps there was a delay. But 35 to 40 since Christ. 
That's pretty amazing, yeah? It's a lot, a lot going on. Good question, though, by the way. And we, all, the, all the false religions were, probably, you know, the guys that were pr professing that mm -hmm. was probably I, I, I. Yeah, well, me, 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 we, me. We. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's probably good. Yeah, yeah. Because it's, it is. The Gnostics were dangerous because if they were proposing that only a ghost went to heaven, then the bodily resurrection is canned. Yeah. Right what, what's ghosts. the point of a bodily resurrection? So that, that's Excellent. That's why that's the, the chief right. evil of the Gnostics. Yes. And the second thing is, is yes, the world is scampering to to get happy. Is it God's will to make us happy? No. It's His will for us to find joy mm -hmm. in fellowship. In fellowship, right. So there's a criteria. So the community of God, the kingdom of God, the local church, yes. the assembly of the saints is literally yes. where you encounter both the divine vertical and the divine, divine horizontal. horizontal. Yeah. Anything outside of that is complete self-deception. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, preach it, brother. Preach, man. Boom. Did you catch that on camera? I can't repeat that whole thing. That's... Yeah, he's got a good voice. We'll good. All right, we'll get it. Good, good. Yeah, could you type it up and underline it and put it on the screen, Tom? Just kidding. Just no. kidding. No. <laughs> we don't pay me enough. Yeah, I know. it's true. I don't pay you enough is right. <laughs> At all. Okay, that's why. Uh, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. Um, okay, the concept of God being light, every, I don't, I'm not going to even dwell there too long because it is so well played all through the scriptures. I mean, uh, pillar of light for Israelites in the desert, the shine on Moses' face, the transfiguration when he has clothes like lightning, and he himself says, I am the light of the world, right? And of course, all through scripture, the opposite of God, the opposite of light is always darkness, right? Exactly. Um, but what I love more about this verse, rather than going into a long treatise about what light is, is how, how did they hear about this? I love this. This is the message we have heard from him. <laughs> like, I love that. This is what we heard directly from him, that he is light yeah i thought that was really good and by the way I'll, I'll wrap up this verse with one quick concept i was listening to a bible project podcast the other day and they were talking about the holy holy holiness of god which we covered a lot when we were in leviticus yeah and even a bit through joshua and they use a really great analogy of the sun because the sun is good the sun gives life yeah we all enjoy the warmth of the sun but the sun can kill you, right? And it's a great analogy of holiness. And if you get too close to the sun, you need what? Sunscreen. Get it? S-O-N. Sunscreen, the blood of Christ, right? Because they covered it. I know Ron's getting throwing up over there, but yeah. But yeah, think about it. How the, the high priest had to cover himself in what? Blood of a lamb, you see this, right? Before he could approach the holy holiness of God. Anyways, it's a side point. I just thought it was a good allegory or whatever about the holiness of God, something you might just sort of put in your memory bank for a future um, time. Now, um, we, we wrap up this section tonight with three categories of those who claim fellowship but actually reject the truth. There are those who are in darkness, those who are in deception or have been deceived, and those who defame God. So verse 6. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. Um, uh, to those uh, in darkness, uh, uh, the, the, the commentary, comment Hater Boltman said he is specifically going at the Gnostics on that. Yeah, if we claim to have fellowship, yet we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. The key word here is walk, and uh, that reminds me of a funny story. Oh, too bad Carrie left because it reminded me of a uh, Chris Tenberg said that one time. Chris Tenberg, um, who Matt, you met him the other day, he's doing surf lessons down at the beach now. Yeah. Chris Temberg, who actually started the Young Adults Bible Study that I took over in like 1992, went off to a, a Christian college, got super smart, and he came back and somebody said something about, how's your walk going? And he laughed and he said, oh, that's such a KCF thing. And KCF back in Rainbow Plaza, we'd always talk about your walk with God. 
how's your walk with God going? And I remember Chris saying, he was kind of laughing at us, going, oh, it's such a KCF thing. How's your walk going? But quite literally, it's biblical. <laughs> if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk. walk the word walk, um, actually, from the word peripateo, peri, means around, meaning how you walk around, right? How you walk around conducting yourself. It refers to your beef behavior. It's not like whether you might have sinned or not, but what is the overall direction of your life, okay? So, in other words, most commentators I read don't believe that this is referring to, like, the Christian who stumbles. But this is just somebody who's dedicated a life of disobedience, living and walking in darkness that defines your life, okay? That ties in with the rest of the book when he says, he who continues, continues to sin, to sin. Does, not know the Lord. does not know the Lord. Exactly, exactly. And so this is that, thank you, Ron, because it's setting all this up. Instead, verse 7, he says, but if we walk in the light, there's that word again, peripateo, if we walk around, if we, our behavior, our, the gist of who we are, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of his son purifies us from all sin, okay? So if your life is defined by him, by his life, by his teachings, by his example, then we are gifted with his light, his fellowship, and fellowship with each other. In fact, uh, more commentators still were going after the whole idea of the fallacy of the solo Christian. Um, the guy, uh, his last name is Westcott, said, fellowship with the brethren is proof of fellowship with God. That's another pretty, I'm telling you, these guys didn't pull any punches on this, yeah? Um, this is, in my own experience, why I get so bummed when people drop out of fellowship, yeah? In fact, I'm looking at Garrett, because we always laugh about this. My big statement, I always say to Garrett is, I'll see you at church on Sunday, right? Uh, and we always laugh because, you know, I, I think it sounds, when a pastor sees you in Big Save and says, uh, hey man, haven't seen you at church, you need to come back to church. If you're cynical, it sounds sort of self-serving, doesn't it? Like, well, of course the pastor wants you to go to church. It's how he makes his living. If the pastor, the pastor wants you to be in church, why? Well, because that's how he grows his church. That's how he looks good. That's how he decrees himself successful. And that's how he makes a living. Of course the pastor wants you to be in church. And buys the black beamer. And yeah, and that's how he buys the black beamer. I hope there's no pastors watching that have a black beamer. You might want to edit that out too, yeah? All that editing. But can I come back to that point? <laughs> Dong. Okay, it sounds self-serving if you're cynical to have a pastor say, you need to be in church, right? But do you understand? Look at the light of what these verses are saying. It is 100% not self-serving for me to tell you that you ought to be in church. It is for you that you need to be in church. Because according to the word, if you're not walking in, in the fellowship of the believers, you are not walking in fellowship with Christ. And it is my desire, and every pastor's, I believe, I hope pastor's desire, is for his people to have fellowship with Christ, right? Verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, who's he talking about right there? The Gnostics, yeah. Yeah. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, if the first group, you know, kind of ignored their sin, this group straight up denies sin. And by the way, uh, everybody that I read today agreed on this. The tense he's talking about here when he says, if we claim to be without sin, isn't so much saying I never did wrong. That's actually the next set of verses, right? This is... This is more of a rejection of the concept of sin. Does that make sense? Altogether. Mm -hmm. This is what the Gnostics were promoting. This idea that mm -hmm. there really is no such thing as sin because our bodies are just material and they're already evil. And so we, our bodies can do whatever they do. And it doesn't count against us, our souls or whatever. Sin is really nothing. And so this is kind of more pronounced in our culture than you might think. Um, 
when, um, you know, if you tell someone you're a Christian and they get all upset, well, you guys go forcing your religion on everybody. No, actually, um, we don't really force our religion on anybody, but we have concepts about things that are right and wrong. And so when we say, yeah, we think that is wrong, we think that's wrong. And they're like, well, why are you so judgmental? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because we believe that there is such thing as sin, right? Uh, or how about um, ideas like, um, well, find your own truth. I I'm, I'm going to just try to find my own truth and follow my heart. Mm. Pray for him. Yeah, pray for him, yeah. Um, there's some very simple theological mathematics and logic in this statement right here. And that is this. If you deny that you have sin, you clearly don't know the truth because the fundamental truth of the gospel is our captivity in sin, right? Salvation is sort of dependent upon the idea that we need to be saved. If we need to be set free, it sort of presupposes we were in slavery. If Christ dies for our sins, it presupposes we have sin. Does that make sense? I mean, we all pretty much know the hardest part to get across to anybody when we explain the gospel to them is the fact that they sin, that they have sin, that their sin needs to be forgiven. So if somebody claims to not have sin, we know logically the truth is not in them. Okay. Okay. That's, by the way, the claim that all you Christians are self-righteous is actually an oxymoron, right? It's philosophically, theologically impossible for a Christian to be self-righteous because flat out to become a Christian means you understand that you don't have any righteousness of your own. At all. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Okay, okay. but instead, uh, verse 9, instead, if we confess our sins, he is, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Um, great memory verse right here. Did any of you have to memorize that? That was me too. Yeah. <laughs> we all... I know. This is like, this might be the first verse I ever memorized. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, was it the um, Mariner's Discipleship book? Does that ring a bell? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Mariner's? No? Mariner's Discipleship book? Anyways, okay, that was one of the first verses uh, Mike Wellman took well, me through. Navigators. Navigators. Yeah. Na Mariner's. Oh. Mariners, navigators, navigators is what I meant. Thank you. Some nautical theme. <laughs> but I want, I want you guys, look back at this verse. I want you to see the link between faithful, forgive, just, and purify. He is faithful to forgive. What does that mean? Well, he promises he will forgive. Right? And so he does. So he's faithful to his promise to forgive. And then look at the connection between just and purify. Right? He is just. And so there has to be a justice. So to have justice, there must be a purification from sin so that justice may occur. Um, I wish I just said, okay. He bears our sin for us so that justice is done. And then last verse of the night. Um, verse 10, um, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. This is literally somebody saying, I have never sinned. Not that they disagree with the concept of sin. They might actually agree with the concept of sin, but say, I have never sinned. And that is a denial. Uh, that's why it is a defamation of God, because God himself asserts that all have sinned. And it also refutes God's contention that all need a savior. So you, um, we make God out to be a liar because God has said those two things are absolutely true. Okay? So to thus deny God's contentions is a sure sign that his word does not dwell in us. Okay. Because we're coming directly against his word if we say we have never sinned. So the two can't coexist in one heart, so to speak. You are one or the other. Yeah. Um, the rest of this book is going to give us direction on how to protect ourselves from faulty teaching. That knowledge about God does not necessarily lead to fellowship with him, but the knowledge of him 
from true confession and the reception of his forgiveness does lead to fellowship with him and obviously with each other. So that's where we're headed um, down the road. And you can probably already see direct connotations and connections to the world we live in right now, where the, uh, I want to say our country, but quite honestly, the entire planet, at least the Western world, um, the, the ship has sort of sailed away from Orthodox um, Christianity. And if you notice what's going on is they're trying to insert, this lady just said this just the other day, where was it, who was it that said it, and it popped out so fast and I just thought, oh my gosh, there it is again. Well, the universe must have wanted me to da-da-da-da-da-da. There it was, the universe. And I was almost like, oh, wait, wait, what? <laughs> but it happened so fast. And I was like, did that person really just say that, that the universe? Mm -hmm. What the heck is that? We all know what that is. It's another name for what they believe God is. But it's trendy, and it sounds more enlightened to say the universe. But if anybody ever says anything like, the universe must have wanted... Think about what that statement implies. The universe has intelligence. The universe has intent. It has a will. You can keep going down that bunny trail. It must have an idea of things that it wants that are good and things that, right? Does that include the aliens? Yeah, it does include the aliens, yeah. Well, it's, it's complete paganism because yes. paganism is worship of the created right. rather than the created. Exactly. Creator. So exactly. if the universe told me, the universe is a created thing. Yeah. We're still dealing with paganism. Still dealing with paganism in 2022. Yeah. Exactly right. And that's why I thought uh, when, when I really started doing the deep dive a couple days ago on the book of John, remember I thought it was just about, hey man, love everybody, yeah? I was like, oh no, this is really deep and this is really good and this is really like applicational to the world that we live in. Absolutely. All right, All right let's pray because we're out of time. Father God, thank you for this night. Thank you for, oh gosh, here we go. Once again, Lord, your amazing and constantly surprising word. I felt like we were surprised by Joshua and now even already one night in, already surprised uh, by this first John, Lord. And that's just so your word. It's eternal, Lord. It's, it's, it's yet unchanging and yet constantly um, revealing new things to us. And I love that about your word. And thank you, Holy Spirit, that it is you that has um, opened up our eyes to see and understand these things. And so we give you glory tonight. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit for the splendor and beauty um, of your eternal word, God. And we look forward to gathering here next week to find out more. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. And oh, Kelly. and we lift up Kelly. Thank you, thank you. And Lord, we lift up Kelly, Lord, and just pray for healing, Lord. We also just continue to lift up uh, Cheryl and Brett for all um, his issues. And we continue to lift up our brother Garrett to bring that healing to full completion. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.